Hi, this is Bobby Collier, and today we're going to talk about hell. And this is going to be the first teaching in a series that we're going to do about hell. And we've already done many teachings on the Old Testament, evil God. We've cleared up many things back in the Old Testament. Now we want to turn our attention and look at the concept of hell. And the title of today's teaching is Abomination, Burning Children Alive. And hell, as most people think of it, it is actually an abomination in the eyes of God. And that's what we're going to see today. Okay, our introduction here. So, um, our objective. So, we want to study to show ourselves approved regarding hell, regarding the concepts of eternal fire and everlasting punishment. And what's going to happen as we... As we do this, just as when we were looking back at the Old Testament, when we begin to look at hell and clear this up, we're going to see the true goodness of God. We're going to continue to love him more. Our faith and our confidence in him will increase. And because of that, our faith fruit will also increase. In other words, we'll be more successful in doing the works of Jesus because we'll see our father as good and only good because the concept of hell is not good. Okay, and as we see God for who he is, we become like him. So we will become more God-like, um, especially in our attitudes towards sinners uh, and other people as we do this study. So here is a list of some of the hell concepts that we're going to look at over time. Okay, so first of all, hell is actually, it's not a biblical word. It was substituted in place of four different original language words and we're going to briefly look at that today and we'll probably come back and look at this idea more later on okay secondly burning people alive is an abomination to our father god is not a hypocrite therefore he does not burn people alive either okay we're going to look at this today then in a future study we will look at the parable of the poor beggar lazarus and the rich man who both had died and Lazarus had gone on to be in Abraham's bosom, and the rich man was frying in a flame of fire in Hades. And what we'll see in this future study is that this is actually a parable. It goes back to the days of Babylon, and it's not something that Jesus had made up right there in that moment. So that's going to be a really important study. Also, we'll look at the ideas of eternal fire and punishment, and we'll see that this is false doctrine, and it's due to mistranslation of three key words, olam from Hebrew, aion in Greek, and aionios in Greek. And this will be in the second teaching in the series, and this is a very important study because it reveals that these three words have been incorrectly translated with eternal implications when, in fact, these words have been used to describe um, periods of time as short as three days, such as when Jonah was in the fish. Um, the Bible says Jonah was in the fish forever. Okay, the word used was olam, and in the Greek version it was ionios. Okay, and the reality is he wasn't in the fish forever. He was in the fish for three days. Yet, yet nearly every rendering of these three words into English is with an everlasting word like forever, eternity, everlasting, eternal, words like that. And that completely changes your doctrine and your understanding of the Bible when you see the truth of what these words really mean in the ancient languages. So this is a, a huge lesson. Okay, um, the Bible is full of symbolism, but yet, probably out of fear, we always take, when it says fire, we take it literally. Okay, and this is a problem because we think of fire, we think there's literally going to be a flame of fire, the furnace of fire, and we're afraid of that, and we teach that, and then we, we go back and we look at, well, look what happened to the rich man. He was frying in a flame of fire, and so we think about literal flames of fire. Okay, well, the truth is that fire is often used figuratively in the Bible and symbolically. So, for example... Uh, going through affliction in life is going through fire, okay? And fire refines, okay? When you go through afflictions in life, when you have faith challenges in life, you are refined. Fire also, if you think back to the Old Testament, there was a prophet who went into the presence of God and he said, I am a sinful man. 
and they took a coal of fire from off the altar and they touched it to his tongue and it purified him. It purified him of his sinfulness. It purified him. So it wasn't a burning flame of fire that tortured him. Rather, it was a, pu a, a purification fire. Okay. And so we're going to look at that at a later time. But I would have you think about how bad did your crucifixion hurt? You don't think of that literally. Why should you think of the lake of fire or the furnace of fire literally? Okay, you were crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Okay, you were crucified with Christ. Your old man was killed, dead, gone. Your old man was crucified. The sinful man that each of us had is crucified, dead, gone. Okay, we should think in that same manner of thinking when we think about fire, just like with the prophet who was purified with the coal of fire, fire has purification connotations. And so we're going to look at that in future lessons. The first thing I wanted to talk about today is hell is actually a made up word. It was substituted for four original language words. Okay, so point number one, the word hell has entered into our Bibles due to an agenda of religion and government to control the people through fear. Okay, so this whole concept of a fiery, fiery hell that lasts forever and ever, that is just simply not true, but it's going to take some work on our part to study it and expose that. And when we see the truth, it's going to be really good for us. Okay, there's no direct word in Hebrew nor in Greek which equates to our modern day fiery hell. Okay, four different words were substituted with the word hell. Okay, we have in the Old Testament, Sheol. Sheol, this is a Hebrew word from the Old Testament that is the place of the dead, the grave or the pit. It was never associated with fire. Okay, and this word was used 65 times in the Old Testament and King James rendered it hell 31 times. He rendered it the grave 31 times, and he rendered it the pit three times. Okay, so Sheol is simply the place of the dead. There was never any fire associated with Sheol. It was just where the dead went. And it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. You recall some people wanted to go to Sheol. Job wanted to go to Sheol. He wanted to leave this earth and go to Sheol. Okay, so it's not necessarily, it's certainly not, it's certainly not hell with a flame of fire as we've been trained to believe in. Okay, the second word is the word Gehenna. And this is a Greek version of the Hebrew words Gehinnom or Valley of Hinnom. And this is a physical place on earth, south of Jerusalem, where trash and dead bodies of animals and criminals were dumped. Due to the trash and dead bodies, there were always worms eating the waste. And fires, they always had fires burning to consume the refuse. And so this explains what Jesus said one time when he was quoting the Old Testament. There's a passage that says, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Okay, well, we think of that as there's a person suffering in hell and there's worms running in and out of their body and they're in a flame of fire and the fire's never quenched and they're just burning and burning eternally and they're continually being eaten with worms and somehow their flesh regenerates and it continues to be eaten. So none of that makes any sense. The truth is Gehenna is a physical place on earth. It was a trash dump. And wherever you have trash and dead bodies, you will have worms, and they had fires burning trying to consume all the waste. So that's why the Old Testament says the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. It's not talking about the life hereafter. It's talking about physical location on earth. Okay. Also, anciently, it was called Tophet, or the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, and it was a place where children were burned alive as sacrifices to Molech and to other gods. Okay, so there was actually, there really was burning alive of people that took place and it was sacrificing to um, pagan gods. We have 12 times total usage in the Bible. King James rendered it hell nine times and hellfire three times. Okay, the third word that was replaced with the word hell is Hades. 
This is a Greek mythology word adopted in the writing of the Bible and Christian doctrine. Hades was the Greek god of the underworld, and the name also refers to the abode of the dead in the heart of the earth. The Greek Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, it renders the Hebrew word Sheol, it translates that into the word Hades. And this word was used 11 times in the New Testament. And King James, he translated it hell 10 times and grave one time. Okay, so I find this really interesting that our Bible has two Greek mythology words describing the place of the dead, Hades and Tartarus. That makes you wonder. Okay, Tartarus, this is our fourth word. This is another Greek mythology word used in the Bible. Tartarus is said to be a sub-region of Hades, which is the deep abyss that is used as a dungeon of torment and suffering for the wicked. Okay, that's what it says in Greek mythology. And this word is only used one time, and it was rendered hell in the King James Bible. So you can see that there's an agenda taking four different words and rendering them all into the word hell. That's an agenda. Okay, there's many other Bibles out there that translate these words, which are proper nouns, translates these words directly as they say, Sheol, Gehenna, Hades, and Tartarus. These are four different things. Okay, and interestingly, as we mentioned, two of these are from Greek mythology. One is a physical place, a real place on earth that's on a map. And then another is simply referring to the place of the dead. Okay, there are several more accurate and truthful Bible translations that do not use the substitutionary word hell, such as Young's literal translation, Rotherham's Bible, 20th century New Testament, Victorious Gospel New Testament, Weymouth New Testament, the World English Bible, the Concordant Literal Version, Diaglet New Testament, Jonathan Mitchell New Testament, and there's even others out there. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to take you through 15 passages, all of which reveal that God's attitude towards burning people alive is that it's an abomination. It is an abomination to burn children alive. Okay, so if it's an abomination for people to burn other people or children alive, then it would be an abomination for God to burn people alive. Okay, so this whole idea of hell, it's an abominable concept. It's completely ungodly. It was never in the mind of God. It was never in the heart of God. It was never something he commanded. It is an abomination in the eyes of God. Number one, Leviticus 18, 21 to 26. And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. Okay, so when the Bible says passing through the fire, that means they were burning them alive as burnt offerings. Live children were burned alive to Molech. And God says this is an abomination. Deuteronomy 12:31. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord, which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Okay, again, it's an abomination to burn your children in fire. Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 10. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer. Okay, again, it's an abomination to pass your son or daughter through the fire. To burn them alive is an abomination. Second Kings 16.3 but he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Indeed, he made his son pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel. Once again, it's an abomination to burn your child alive. 
2 Kings 17, 16-17. So they left all the commandments of the Lord their God, made for themselves a molded image and two calves, made a wooden image, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served Baal. And they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, practice witchcraft and soothsaying, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Once again, God says that it is evil, it is evil to burn your children alive in the fire. If it's evil for us to burn children alive in a fire, it's evil for God to burn children alive in a fire, to burn us, his children, alive in the fire. It is ungodly, it's an abomination, and from God's own mouth, it's it's evil. God cannot commit evil. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. There's no abomination in God. There's no evil in him. Amen? Let's keep going. Number six. 2 Kings 21, 1-6 Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Also he made his son pass through the fire, practice soothsaying, used witchcraft, and consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Okay, so according to God, he did evil and he committed an abomination when he passed his son through the fire. Again, God would be a hypocrite to declare it evil and an abomination for us to burn our children alive, yet he turn around with a double standard and do the same thing that he told us not to do. He can't do that. He can't do that. It's an abomination. It is evil to burn people alive, period. Number seven, Second Kings 23.10. And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire to Molech. Okay, so this passage is referring to King Josiah. And he defiled this place called Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom. And this valley of the son of Hinnom, which is where Topheth is located, it's, um, it's also called Gehenna in the New Testament. And it's been translated in King James and many other Bibles into the word hell. Okay, this is a physical place on earth, Topheth. And the valley of the son of Hinnom are south of Jerusalem. And this is a place where anciently, they used to sacrifice their children to Molech. They would burn them alive. Okay, And King Josiah, he defiled this place because he was trying to stop this practice. He was trying to stop the abominable, evil practice of people burning their sons and daughters in the fire to Molech. Amen? So thank God for King Josiah. But importantly, I want you to see that you know King James' so-called hell is also a physical place on earth. Number eight, Second Chronicles 28, 1-3. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord, as his father David had done. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and molded images for the Baals. He burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burned his children in the fire, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Okay, so God declares that, that the things that Ahaz was doing, such as burning his children alive, these things were not right. In other words, they were evil. They were ungodly things. And notice that he was in hell in Gehenna in the valley of the son of Hinnom where he was burning his children alive. So he burned more than one child alive in the fire. And God says this is an abomination. It is an abomination. It's an abominable deed to burn your children alive. Amen. And again, the valley of the son of Hinnom is Gehenna. And according to King James, he calls it hell. It's a physical place on earth. Number nine, 2 Chronicles 33, 1 to 6. 
Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Also he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. This is a replay of what Second Kings mentions about Manasseh. Okay, again, God says, burning your children alive, it is evil. It's an abomination. And all this took place in hell, the physical place called the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, also known in, in Greek as Gehenna, or in King James, known as hell. Okay, it is evil to burn your children alive. Let's go on. Number 10, Jeremiah 7, 30 to 31. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to pollute it. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. Okay, so notice, once again, God says it is evil to burn your children alive. God says again, it is an abomination to burn your children alive. And again, he calls out the location where they were doing this. It was in Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom. And the valley of the son of Hinnom is Gehenna and is also translated to hell. And in hell, they burned their sons and daughters in the fire. And God says, this is something I did not command it nor did it come into my heart. So God says that it's nowhere in his heart to burn children alive. Okay, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. Our Father, our Jesus, our Holy Spirit, they do not change. And so if it was not in the heart of God for people to burn alive children in a fire, then it is not and never will be in the heart of God to burn anyone alive, such as in a, a flame of fire, in hell, in Hades, or anything like that. It is an abomination, it is evil, and it is not in the heart of God to burn people alive. He does not change. If it was not in his heart back then in the Old Testament, it is never, it will never be in the heart of God to burn someone in a literal, suffering, torturous flame of fire. Thank God for that. Amen. Jeremiah 32, 34 to 35. But they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Okay, again, God says it's an abomination to burn children alive in fire. He says they defiled, they defiled the house of God by doing these things. When you defile something, you make it unholy. It is an unholy, abominable, evil thing to burn your children alive. And, and God does not have a double standard. The same thing that applies for us burning children alive also applies to him. And, you know, you can read many of these passages. It was an abomination for the evil people to burn their children alive. Not only for us to burn, not only for the children of God to burn people alive, but it's an abomination for ungodly people to burn ungodly children alive. Amen. So it doesn't matter whether the person saved or not saved, whether they're a so-called child of God or or a pagan, or anything like that, that does not matter. It's evil. It's an abomination. It's horrendous. God says he did not command these things. He says it did not come into his mind that this abomination should be done. It is nowhere in the mind of God to burn people alive. Okay, If you're born again, 
If you have received the Holy Spirit, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. If you are born again, the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart. If you are born again, you have received the Spirit of Christ, and you have received all the wisdom of God. If you are born again, you now have the mind of Christ. And because you have the mind of Christ, that's why you revolt at the things the abominable deeds done in the name of God in the Old Testament. And that's why you revolt at the concept of of burning people alive in a torturous hellfire for all eternity. You revolt at these things because they're repulsive to God. They're an abomination to God. And if you're born again, you have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of God. You have the heart of God. You have the compassion of God. You have the love of God. And because you have all these things in you, because God is in you, That's why you can't stand the idea of hell. That's why you can't stand the idea of the abominations that were done in the Old Testament by Yahweh. You can't stand it because you have the love of God. Amen? And God doesn't change his mind. You know, what was an abomination back in Jeremiah's day? It's an abomination now. It is an abomination to burn children alive. It was not in the mind of God then. It will never be in the mind of God. It's not in the heart of God then. It will never be in the heart of God. It wasn't something he commanded then. It's not something he will ever command. He will never command someone to be burned alive in a flame of fire. Amen. Number 12. Ezekiel 16, 20 to 22. Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters, whom you bore to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your acts of harlotry a small matter, that you have slain my children and offered them up by causing them to pass through the fire? And in all your abominations and acts of harlotry, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, struggling in your blood. Okay, so God says that these people committed abominations when they sacrificed their children, and these children he called them his own children. Okay, so God calls our children his children. Amen? God calls our children his children. They are his kids. They are his kids. We are his kids. All of us are the children of God. Some are born again, some are not yet born again, but we are all God's children. Amen? Okay, so they sacrificed them to gods to be devoured in a flame of fire. Okay, they caused them to pass through the fire. It was an abomination. Ezekiel 20, 25 to 26. Therefore, I also gave them up to statutes that were not good and judgments by which they could not live. And I pronounced them unclean because of their ritual gifts and that they caused all their firstborn to pass through the fire that I might make them desolate and that they might know that I am the Lord. Okay, so these people, they were burning alive their firstborn children in the fire. They burned them alive and God declared that they were unclean, meaning they were unholy, meaning what they were doing was ungodly, it was evil, it was an abomination for them to burn their children alive. Number 14. Ezekiel 20, 30 to 31. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Are you defiling yourselves in the manner of your fathers and committing harlotry according to their abominations? For when you offer gifts and make your sons pass through the fire, you defile yourselves with all your idols even to this day. So shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Okay, so God says that these people defiled themselves by committing the abomination of burning their children alive in the fire. Okay, they defiled themselves, which means they made themselves unholy, which means what they were doing was an evil, abominable deed, which defiled them, which made these people unclean. It is an evil thing to burn your children alive. Lastly, number 15, Ezekiel 23, 36 to 37. The Lord also said to me, Son of man, will you judge Ohola and Aholaba? Then declare to them their abominations, for they have committed adultery, and blood is on their hands. They have committed adultery with their idols, and even sacrificed their sons, whom they bore to me, 
passing them through the fire to devour them. Once again, God declares it is an abomination to sacrifice your children and to burn them alive, passing them through the fire, and which devoured them. They were completely consumed. They were devoured by the flame of fire. Okay, if it's an abomination for people to do these things, it's an abomination for God to do these things. It is an abominable act to burn people alive. And also, I just called out in blue this word devour. We know that Satan is the one who's the adversary of man who seeks those whom he may devour. And I just wanted to point out that particular word because we know that devouring is associated with Satan, not with God. God does not devour. He is not destroying. He's not killing. We know that God does not have the power of death. We know that Jesus said that he did not come to this earth to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Amen? Okay, so God is not a hypocrite. Let's read these points. Number one, Jesus repeatedly came against hypocrisy in the Gospels. God cannot declare to us that it is an abomination to burn children alive and then turn around and do it himself. That would be hypocrisy. Whatever standards God sets for us, he also has for himself. Otherwise, he would be a hypocrite. And Jesus warned us to beware of hypocrisy and that woes will come to hypocrites. Okay, so God is not a hypocrite. He doesn't Tell us it's wrong for us to do something and then turn around and do the same thing. Point number two. Assuredly, God is good and only good. In him is no darkness at all. Okay, so that means that in God there is no blazing hellfire at all. Because God said that it was evil to burn your children alive. It was an abomination to burn children alive. So if it's an abomination for man to do it, it's an abominable evil thing for God to do it. And in him is no darkness at all. Therefore, there is no blazing hellfire in God. God does not have a blazing fire of hell for anyone. And God cannot lie. He's not a hypocrite. Therefore, he cannot declare it an abomination for us to burn alive our children, yet he burned alive most of humanity in hell. He can't do it. He won't do it. It's a complete misunderstanding. Amen. In Matthew 23, 1-3, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. Okay, so Jesus is specifically saying that the Pharisees were hypocrites and they would command people to do certain things, yet they would not do them themselves. Okay, likewise, God cannot c command us not to burn our children alive and then do it himself. He would be a hypocrite just like the Pharisees. Matthew 23, 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Okay, so notice, woes come to hypocrites. Okay, so God's not a hypocrite. It, it's an abomination for men to burn people alive. It would be abominable for God to do it. And therefore, he will not do that. And also notice, we'll talk about this more later on, but there is there are degrees of condemnation. And we'll see this in the next teaching, actually. There are degrees of condemnation. You know, according to our current way of thinking, most people believe that there's an eternal punishment of hellfire. So how could you have a greater condemnation? Do you get like a hotter section in hell? If you're burning in a flame of fire, you're burning. It's torturous any way you look at it. Greater condemnation. There will be greater severity for a punishment or correction for some people versus others. And it, we'll see in the next lesson, there's an age of correction. It's not eternal correction, eternal punishment. It is an age of correction. An age of correction. We'll see that in the next lesson. Okay. But also remember, Jesus talked about that one person will be beaten with many stripes and one person beaten with few stripes okay there are degrees of punishment there's not an everlasting punishment okay we'll see that in the next one matthew 23 
27 to 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Okay, if God was merely trying to appear righteous to men by saying, don't do those abominable deeds of burning people alive, but yet he turned around and did it himself, that would just be an appearance of righteousness. Now, it is unrighteous. Therefore, he referred to it as defiling themselves and bringing forth, un being, un being made unclean by doing the evil and abominable deeds of burning children alive. Okay, so therefore, God, he is not a hypocrite. Therefore, he is not putting on a show, um, an outward appearance of righteousness. He's not putting on a show. He is righteous. And in his righteousness, he says it is ungodly to burn people alive. Okay, so he will not do that himself. Luke 12, 1. In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Okay, so there are many, many other passages, but here are four passages from Jesus, which are talking about hypocrisy, and he tells us to beware of it. Okay, this is the leaven of the Pharisees, hypocrisy. Okay, so God's not a hypocrite. Jesus wouldn't be speaking against it if he himself was a hypocrite. Okay, he doesn't do it. Therefore, all the things that God said were abominable, um, defiling, unclean, and evil, they're also the same for him, and therefore he doesn't do those deeds. Okay, and one last passage on hypocrisy, Romans 2, 21 to 24. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. Okay, you could also say, you who say it's an abomination to burn your children alive, do you burn children alive? Okay, amen. It's the same concept. The Holy Spirit is speaking against hypocrisy in Romans 2. And Holy Spirit speaking against it. Therefore, God does not commit hypocrisy. God is not a hypocrite. Therefore, God is not burning anyone alive. It's not in his heart. It's not in his mind. It's an abomination. It's evil. It's not something he will ever do, period. Thank God for that. Amen. Here's some closing thoughts. Number one, hell is a made up word that has been substituted for four other words. Hell has been substituted for Sheol, for Hades, for Tartarus, and Gehenna. And we will study more about these later. Number two, burning people alive is an abomination to our Father. God is not a hypocrite. If it is an abomination for us to burn children alive, then it is an abomination for him to burn his children alive in hell. Therefore, God does not burn people alive in an endless torment of hellfire. Thank God and amen. Number three, God specifically said, I did not command them. And he also said, nor did it come into my heart. And he also said, nor did it come into my mind for children to be burned alive in fire. It is not in the heart of our daddy to burn people alive. Period. He clearly stated this. He said this time and time again. It's evil. It's an abomination. It's unclean. It's a defilement. It's not in my mind. It's not in my heart. I did not command it. And God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never commanded it. He never will. It was never in his heart. It never will be. It was never in his mind. It never will be. Thank God. Number four. God specifically said they have done evil in his sight by burning people alive. Daddy considers burning by fire evil. God is good and in him is no darkness at all. 
He cannot commit evil. Thus, he cannot burn people alive, which he himself says is great evil. It is an abomination. He cannot do it because it is darkness, it is evil, and he is good and only good. Amen. Number five, God said that the people defiled themselves and were made unclean by burning their children alive. Likewise, if he were to burn people alive, he would defile himself. Defilement is making something or someone unholy, which is impossible for God because he is holy. So God cannot commit a deed that would defile himself. He cannot commit an unholy deed such as burning alive. That would be a defilement. It's not something he can do. Amen? Okay, the, number six. In the next lesson, we will see that Olam, Ion, and Ionios have been grotesquely mistranslated. This is where we get the concepts of everlasting punishment, eternal fire, and everlasting contempt. And we're, we're going to see the truth of it is that there is age-long correction, there is age-lasting fire, and it's a figurative fire, and age-long contempt. The same words translated as everlasting were also used to describe Jonah's three days in the fish. Okay, so this gets real interesting. You will see a grotesque mistranslation of those three words. And that gross mistranslation of words that refer to an age of time, they have been grotesquely translated into eternal words, everlasting, forever, evermore, and things like that. And that completely changes our understanding of the Bible. It completely warps our doctrine especially when it comes to what happens when we die, we, because of these mistranslations, we have the idea of an eternal hellfire, and that's just not true. There will be an age of correction, but there will not be an, an eternal suffering of any kind. Amen? And the last thing I want to leave us with, two verses. Luke 9, 56. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Let these words just sink in deep and let them just reign in your heart. Jesus did not come to this earth to destroy men's lives. He came to save us. And we need to grow in our understanding of what this salvation entails. Because it's a greater salvation than what we've entertained before. 1 Timothy 4.10 for to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Do you hear what this verse says? Let's read it again. 1 Timothy 4.10 For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men especially of those who believe. The Bible says that God is the Savior of all men, all men, sinner, saint, believer, and unbeliever. All men means all men. And then in particular, it says, especially he is the Savior of those who believe. So all men shall be saved, all of us. Every last one of us shall be saved, period. This is a crystal clear scripture. In the next lesson, we're going to see other scriptures that are like this. There are many scriptures that speak of the salvation of all men, but we haven't believed those because we couldn't reconcile it because we had this concept of an eternal hellfire and eternal punishment. Okay, Once we kill this idea that there's an eternal hellfire punishment, once we kill this thing, when we see the truth, then we'll be able to believe in a scripture like this that says that Jesus is the Savior of all men. Okay, He's especially the Savior of those who believe. Why is that? Because there are benefits of being in a relationship with God in this present life. Okay? If we believe in Jesus in this present life, we can live free from sickness. We can live free from pain. We can have peace in life. We can have all the fruit of the Spirit in life. 
We have promises that all of our needs will be met. We have promises of protection. We have promises of long life. We have promises that no evil will befall us. We have promises that nothing shall by any means harm us. We have promises that poison and serpents cannot harm us, and on and on. So there is a great salvation, present tense, in this very life right now for those who truly believe. The problem is most people say they believe, but they don't believe in much of anything except that they get to go to heaven. Okay, that's not really believing. That's just a tiny belief. Okay, we need to believe in much more than that because God is a savior, especially of believers who can believe in all the promises of God and enjoy those benefits in this present life. Okay, we're also believers are especially saved because we get God-like life, Zoe life now we enter into eternal life with God when we die, whereas there is an age of correction for those who didn't believe. Amen? Okay, so we avoid this age of correction. We avoid the age of fire, which is a correctional period for those who did not believe. Amen? So we are especially saved, we who believe now, because our old man, our sinful man, has already been killed. Our old man, our sinful man, was already crucified with Christ. Okay, For those who leave this earth, who die as sinners and unbelievers, their old man still has to die, and it's going to die in fire, figurative fire. Amen? So I'm going to close with that. Jesus is the Savior of all men. God bless you, and we'll talk again soon. Bye-bye.